Yes, 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 you're here, joined by none other than Michael Condry. Michael, how are you doing? I hate to start off in a negative, but I'm feeling old now, because this is the third time I know. in a row that... We've grown old together, haven't we, Calvin, That's... right? You've seen us from Modern Warfare 3, Yep. great game. Advanced Warfare, first near future game. Now we're going back to the yeah. roots. It brought us all around, full cycle. It really is, and uh, as a studio, it's... Um, it's humbling, it's a real honor to have this chance, right? Ten years the franchise has been away from World War II and now clearly fans were asking to come back to that more strategic, traditional style of combat and um, yeah, we're excited. I mean, you led the with the exosuit, you started off that extra dimension to the game and now you guys are the ones bringing it back to, as you call it, boots on the ground. Who kind of sets that direction? What makes you think, okay, this is where people want to go now? Well, really, I've got to be honest, it's, it's fans. We come out of a, a game like Modern Warfare 3 and we really listen to fan feedback. And in that game, super proud of that game. As you know, that was a great game. We won Action Game of the Year um, and fans were very generous um, in their compliments for the game. But there was an underlying narrative of, hey, let's, let's find a new way to play Call of Duty. True innovation step change in terms of what um, the second to second combat might be like. And so we talked a lot about what was the best vehicle for that and that led us to the near future. And, the exoskeleton and an all new movement set we hadn't seen in a, you know 15 years. Yep. Um, and at that moment in time, it was the right decision, right? Clearly, and fans reacted to it and there was a lot of excitement. Um, and then shortly after that, the conversation started right after we shipped um, about what, what type of story hasn't been told in a while? What type of experience um, has Call of Duty not serviced in a while? And, and in, in this in this way that I love in other great beloved franchises like I don't know when Daniel Craig sort of rebooted the Bond franchise yep. right which was a really powerful moment um, we had the opportunity to take Call of Duty back to where it started and as a fan of Call of Duty which I was before a developer um, and that was a really humbling opportunity right yep. to, to be given the chance to tell the stories, the great, you know, stories of bravery and heroism of World War II, and to take multiplayer back to, to boots on the ground, that was something we couldn't pass up. So let's talk about the multiplayer for a little bit, because you talked about the exciting features like the exosuit that you introduced in the last game, and I call it feature creep. We've had a lot of new exciting features over the years, but now you, you've had to address that and it's kind of, you've stripped it down a little without taking too much away. Can you tell us how you've done that, how you've managed to do that? You know, when we really th started to think about what that experience we wanted for the multiplayer um, offering, there were two things that we were really trying to do. Obviously, you know, capturing that traditional Call of Duty uh, core combat that people know and love was important, but we needed to do it in a modern way. And then second to that was bringing true innovation around that experience. So unlike Advanced Warfare and the, the movement set that innovated within that core experience, this was getting true refinement of that core experience and then building these great features around it. So I think that boots on the ground experience that you played um, it feels like a modern take on a Call of Duty World War II experience. Um, the map design is really refined, weapon balance feels right on point. We've got good score streaks and character customizations that are meaningful. Um, a complete redesign of our create a class process and divisions, yep. which leads to um, really interesting role choices um, around these five iconic divisions, which I think really impact the second to second. So we feel really good about that. Um, I think the perks as well, people are going to notice the perk system is completely different now, isn't it? It certainly is, yeah, that's a great point. Perks are gone, in fact. Um, what we really wanted to deliver was this fantasy of enlisting in World War II. And as a soldier, you have two fundamental choices, and that's it, right? What is your division, which leads to your uniform and your weapon, your weapon skill, your player abilities, and then the single basic training skill that supplements your character type. Um, and there's a wide range of those, depending on your play style. But just those two choices really set up who you are in, in the game. And then the big innovations around that, um, that really are sort of new ways to play Call of Duty you've never had before. One is war, which you've got some time with. Um, everyone's having a, a, a ton of fun with war. It's this 
asymmetrical, linear experience, sort of narrative-driven experience um, in multiplayer, right? Clashes of factions over these really iconic battles. And of course, headquarters. Right. Redefining how we come together as a, as a social community with new ways to compete, like 1v1 and the competitive firing range, new ways to be social, to be rewarded, to show off all of those things. So I think you've always tried to answer the questions or solve the problems we didn't know were problems, haven't you? So waiting around in lobbies with your friends, sitting around waiting for the next game, that's gone now because you've introduced HQ, which is essentially reimagining what you're doing between games, isn't it? Yeah, thank you for saying that. We, we really describe it as an immersive off the front lines experience, right? The front line being in match, right? And if you think of this six year arc that we've been on, Sledgehammer Games has been on, at the end of Modern Warfare 3, you had no character, you had no expression of your of your soldier, you had your gamer tag and that was it. Right? And so we brought that to life with your character customization and your virtual lobby where you could see the people in your lobby, but you still were sort of beholden to that 90 second countdown window between matches. We have a seamlessly integrated living social world now where it, during that lobby intermission you were in an instant, single button, in a living world, 48 players. Or maybe between matches, you you want to go test out a new weapon that you've unlocked. Or maybe um, you showed up in the evening and you're waiting for your mates and they're running a little late and you can jump in, hit the firing range. Or maybe you're a, a solo player who needs to find a party to go play zombies, which you can launch straight from headquarters. And so that, that experience, um, is really meant to serve as a different way to come together as a community that isn't all about just your individual KD, right? And that really speaks to us about the war. The war was about the camaraderie of individual soldiers coming together, um, whether on the front lines or off. I think that reflects throughout the whole game. So touching on the single player very briefly, Call of Duty are known for the big blockbuster titles, and this seems to have taken it a step back to, to more war stories, if, I, if I'm right. So that's a, another change in direction there. Again, in our last few games, and even games outside of the franchise that we've made, often you'll make a, um, a you know, a hero story. It's, it's a journey of a single protagonist. Um, and in particular, in Modern 3 and, and Advanced Warfare, you know, it was kind of the singular super soldier, the tier one soldier. Yeah who could go into battle fully equipped and armed with everything he needed to be a tier one soldier. World War II was not about tier one soldiers, right? It was about 19, 20 year old young men being thrust into um, uh, you know, a war where they largely were outnumbered, outgunned, tired, cold, scared, right? Common men relying on the camaraderie, um, of the, of the squad, right? So it became a more personal journey of how these um, men and women came together to survive. And what I really love about it, and, and through all the research we did, and all the veterans we talked to, and all the books we read, and documentaries we consumed, I have to tell you, it, you know, it just, this, this sense of, um, humility and humbleness of the soldier is really profound. None of them, not a single veteran you talk to, considers themselves a hero. Right. But they consider the people that they fought with heroes. And that is such an amazing and powerful emotion. And so our story tries to capture that, tries to capture um, a more personal tale of the, you know, the best and the worst of, of what war brings out on both sides. Thank you very much for your time, Michael. As always, a pleasure to see you.